Hey, everybody. This is Alana. I am here with my friend, Becky Kopitsky. How are you, Becky? I'm good today, Alana. How are you doing? Oh, I'm good. So if you listen to the Praying for Women podcast, you have heard Becky come on plenty of times before, and she helps us with a lot of stuff, as well as part of our Praying for Women leadership team. She is an author. She's a mom. She's a great friend. Do you want to tell us a tiny bit more about yourself for people who don't know you yet? Oh, absolutely. So like you said, writing is my passion. My family is my passion. I live in Wisconsin, so we often have a lot of snow stories to share with one another, although mm -hmm. a lot of yours are always better than mine. <laughs> and I am, I'm just I'm passionate about reading. I'm passionate you know, about Christian faith. And I love to combine my love for content with my, you know, my love for Jesus and my love for encouraging others. So I work in addition to a writer as a coach, particularly in content marketing for other faith-based content creators, whether they're podcasters or authors or coaches or ministry leaders. And I just have a blast doing it. And you and I have gotten to know each other so well through various projects we've done together and just mm -hmm. talking about life as you know, uh, a, a woman, a mom who yeah. works from home and is a creator and has that creative brain. And so that's, that's pretty much me in a nutshell. I've got a yeah. fabulous husband and two daughters and very loud dogs who may or may not bark during this conversation. <laughs> well, the good news is that people who know me are probably used to dogs that bark and <laughs> you yeah. know, not, not that it's a competition, but I'm going to say mine are probably bigger than yours. <laughs> yes, I'm sure they are. <laughs> one of them, one of mine is small enough to be on my lap. He will probably be on my lap before Ew. we're done. <laughs> <laughs> That's adorable. Well, for those of you who are joining us today, I have a, a really fun kind of topic that I roped Becky into jumping on with me. So the most recent novel that I have published is called Toils and Snares, and the phrase Toils and Snares comes from the hymn Amazing Grace, and that hymn plays a, a decent-sized role in the book itself. So Becky read the book, and then we put our brains together. I'm like, wouldn't it be fun to provide, because I think both you and I have the same heart, is that we want to give people something that they want like a novel for entertainment or training for coaches, but we also want to help them learn and to be inspired in their Christian walk and Absolutely. things like that. So I know for me, like most of the time, my books aren't just books for entertainment. And so the theme of Amazing Grace and specifically the Amazing Grace hymn is pretty heavy in the book, Toil and Snares. And so I thought it would be fun for Becky and I to jump on. And basically our goal is we're going to talk through the kind of prayer points and the prayer lessons that the hymn gives us. So I'm really excited and I'm glad you agreed to get roped into this. Oh, I love these conversations. <laughs> so before we jump into Amazing Grace, tell us a tiny bit about Toils and Snares, because I know you read it and I had so much fun getting like your text updates like in real time as you I were reacting to, say, to it. It is really fun when the author is your friend and you can do those things. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I would reach parts where I did not see the twist coming and I would text you saying, what? Of course, you knew exactly what was happening. And I, yeah, I, there yeah. will be no spoilers for anyone who has not read the book yet. I won't spoil. But but uh -huh. it was for me, it was it, it was fun and how fast paced it was. And all of a sudden, you know, I, I had just gotten to love the characters and all of a sudden there's a twist. <laughs> in that episode. Right. And so it was just, it, it was great fun in that, first of all, it is very well written and you are an excellent writer. And that to me is yeah. always a joy, always a joy. Quality writing is always a joy for me to read. And, but just the character development and understanding the, some of the backstory and how there is depth to the characters mm -hmm. and how because there's depth to the characters you you come to understand them or think that you understand oh, right. <laughs> right you think you know what's oh, going on <laughs> right and, and and but then at the same time there's intrigue and I felt like I was sort of on the edge of my seat the whole time knowing this is meant to be suspense right I hmm. think I'm sort of preempting okay there's got to be something around the corner and I, right? I got just <laughs> hooked into the sweet parts of the story before bam I realized <laughs> now oh there it is 
right. so it was, it was just, it was fun, but it did have depth and meaning because the main character does have in particular a, a faith that she means to uphold. And she has uh-huh. a past, some relationships where, you know, in particular, Amazing Grace is a very important hymn to her. And mm-hmm. so it, the, the beautiful thing about the fact that you draw faith practice into the natural stories of your characters is that that is something relatable for those of us reading the book for whom in other types of fiction, it's weird to hear, to read about somebody praying or somebody doing a a, a Mm -hmm. prayer journal. Uh, For those of us for whom that's our normal life, it's unusual to read about a character who is exemplifying the very things that are also priority priority in our own lives. And so to me, that was a real treat. That was a real treat to like, oh, here's a girl I actually can relate to. So yeah. Yes, yeah, it's fun. I mean, yes and no. I I hope never to be in her actual situation. Yeah, right. <laughs> you don't want to relate to her too closely. No, too closely. <laughs> Read the book and you'll know what I mean. <laughs> I love that. Well, again, it was fun getting your your text feedback as you were going through it. So <laughs> Thank you for that. And you so, would not give me any spoilers either, by the way, everybody. Right. Never text Alana <laughs> when you're in the middle of reading her book. She said, mm, I don't know. Could be, could be not. <laughs> right. <laughs> Just keep reading. And, and uh-huh. I did. We were joking earlier that that I thought, I, you know, I, I read the book on my Kindle. And then I got the hard copy in the mail. And I looked at the hard copy and thought, oh my goodness, it is a full-scale book. I thought it was a novella because I read it so fast. (laughs) (laughs) So that that is cool. Well, one thing we like to do when we're on the Praying Christian Women podcast is our just for fun question. So I'm going to put you on the spot. Do you have any memory? What's your strongest memory about Amazing Grace or maybe the first time you remember hearing it or it it is such a, I don't even want to say popular because I think that, you know, that's almost like pop. It comes in and out of style. It is such a classic in yeah. the the repertoire of someone who grew up in the church and continues to be involved in church. So do you have any yeah. stories about that specific hymn? I actually do. It It, it is tied very closely to our family because it was sung at both of my grandmother's funerals and I had to sing it at my one of my grandmother's funerals and I was I think I was 19 or something like that no 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 I was older I was in my young 20s but it has such meaning because of that because it is a reminder that this world is not all there is Mm -hmm. and to me I find a lot of comfort in that hymn especially you know as I've you know into adulthood as I grew to know the Lord better and really understand what, you know, what he did for me on the cross to read Mm -hmm. and to sing that hymn. It's a natural outpouring of what's actually in our hearts. So I, it's a song that's commonly sung at funerals and, and families will have emotional connections to the song because of that, but it is so much more than that. It's not a funeral song. It's a a (laughs) song of life. It's a song of, of gratitude and, and, and yes, it's a reminder that, that at the end, you know, we're, life is, is forever. There is eternal life, mm-hmm. but the mm-hmm. song itself is about life and salvation, not about death. And so that to me is so, so encouraging. So it's, it's been a, a meaningful song in my family of origin for many years, but for me yeah. personally, it's meaningful for an entirely different reason because yeah. I'm saved by his grace. Right. Yeah. So it's beautiful. That's to me. cool. Well, I've been leading music at our church for the past year and a half, and I found this trick. And I wasn't specifically studying like how do you create a worship set for a church. This was, I think, it was like a business book or a personal development book. But the trick I learned is that radio DJs, if they are trying to introduce a new song to their audience, they will play it between two like very well known, like Celine Dion is a really classic example. Like if you want to introduce, because almost regardless of the genre, it's like people know Celine Dion. They, they have, you know, even if she's not your favorite singer, even if you don't even have like an emotional opinion about her music, it sounds familiar. And so when you hear Celine Dion and then you hear a new song and then you hear like another song that's like, oh, I know this song. This is, you know, like I said, kind of that classic it really yeah. cements. So when I introduce a new song in our song set, <laughs> I will often put it either right before or right after. My two go-tos for this are putting it right before, right after Amazing Grace or Holy, Holy, Holy. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> so 
<laughs> you know, it'll be like amazing grace. And then we'll do this like brand new thing from elevation worship. And then we'll go right. to holy, holy, holy. <laughs> but it's, You know, it's sandwiching. I love the new, that. The new song. Yeah. And... Oh, you could throw a little how great thou art in there. I mean, that, <laughs> for a little variety, you know, but. Oh, that I just made really myself funny. notes in my lyric book. I'm like, this is a good one for opening because everybody sings really loud. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, you know or, I'm going to be watching for that now. I wonder if our church does the same. I, w- yeah. I sang on my worship team for 18 years and I never noticed, but that's interesting. Yeah. I know. It's, it's hey, it's hey everybody, new song. I'm going to teach you a new song today. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be like Pavlovian. We're going to sing Amazing Grace. Yeah. And everyone's going to be like, what new song are we singing today? <laughs> I would love that actually. <laughs> Funny. Fun. Well, what we want to do today is an example of how you can take a hymn like Amazing Grace or truly anything. You could do this with a psalm. You could do it with any song you feel like. You could do it with a piece of poetry. When I've been stuck in a waiting room with nothing to my myself, like I've done it with magazine articles that aren't even like Christian magazines. But what we want to show you is how you can go through the words to something like the lyrics of Amazing Grace and use them as springboards for prayer. So that is basically our kind of loosey-goosey goal here. So let's just jump in. Uh, We'll start with verse one. And so basically I'll read it and then we'll pause and talk about it. And then we'll move on to the other verses. So amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Of Mm -hmm. of those, like, which is the part of that first verse that, that grips you the most, would you say? Oh, it's always that I once was lost. That is my story. I didn't come to know Jesus until I was 28 years old. So to me, this, this really means something. And so my first, my natural response to that is gratitude. So, and that's how I often Mm -hmm. will take any piece of scripture or hymn and start the prayer process. It's just with Mm -hmm. gratitude. Like I was lost. And you found me, you know, you, you always knew where I was and, and you allowed me to find you Lord. And, and, and you allowed me to see, and just the gratitude that comes out of me when I think about those things first. So for me, it's definitely, well, you know, in that wretch part, yeah, that still fits. <laughs> yeah, that's me. <laughs> that's me. But just the idea of what I used to be compared yeah. to what I am now that I understand salvation. It's just, it's really, really profound. How about you? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I love what you were saying because I was a little different in that I grew up in the church. And I I mean, I definitely had moments where, you know, like a moment of rededication or a moment of rebellion and a moment of coming back. But it wasn't like a clear before I was saved and after I was saved in my mind. So sometimes what I like to do and what I encourage people to do, if you're in a similar situation, maybe you don't have a great picture of being completely lost or being a complete wretch in your adult life. So that's where I like to put on my novelist hat and use my imagination and basically go, okay, where would I be yeah. if God hadn't saved me? And at 41 years old, I know I wouldn't be alive now, you know, it would have been suicide or it would have been something else. And, and so, yeah, that's, that's kind of where I go, but I'm the same in this, in this first verse, the, the idea of I once was lost in my mind goes to, I don't know how scary it is when you lose a kid, you know, yes. both of our two youngest have gotten lost in the woods in kind of scary ways. I mean, mm. and never more than I think, let's call it maybe 30 minutes max where they were lost. We were looking at, it was always like, it was on our property, but we had like woods just going on forever. Mm -hmm. And it was scary for us. It was scary for them. And just that feel of, I don't know where my baby is. Like that's, that's a scary feeling. Yes. And as a child, that's a scary feeling as well. If you put yourself back in those shoes. I mean, my daughters used to cling to me in a store because they were Mm -hmm. afraid of getting lost. And as adults, we can still get lost in many, many ways. And so Mm -hmm. just remembering that there is somebody out there who has a GPS on us at all times is really, really encouraging. (laughs) <laughs> I remember being a kid and my dad would drive with the old, you know, fold up maps and he'd pull over and be like, okay, we're lost. I need to look at the map. And in my mind, I thought lost meant, I don't know how to get us back home. And basically he was just saying, I don't know where I'm going next. Right. But there was never a moment where he couldn't have turned around and gotten us home. Yeah. But 
And I never communicated it to him. Like, I was always scared that what he was saying is, I don't know how to get us back home. We might be wandering for the rest of our lives. (laughs) (laughs) That's a really interesting distinction, isn't it? Yeah. 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 And, and that feel of being lost as a child. And that is how, how lost we all were um, without God guiding us. And even, you know, even as adults and even as Christians trying to live in obedience to God, there can be feelings of being lost, right? Like Mm -hmm. I'm just kind of floundering. I I don't really know where I'm going. I feel like I'm just, you know, bobbing on the waves and where is it going to take me? And there, there can be feelings like that. There can be in the whole idea of what comes next. And yet, like, I love what you said. Your dad always knew how to get you back home. Right. And we always, <laughs> we still have that true North, right? We still have Jesus. He's always, yeah. we always know where to find him. Yeah. We just might not know what comes next, but again, he does. He just yeah. might not. It's like your book, right? He won't reveal it until you turn the page. <laughs> right. And, and sometimes he uses others. Like in both of our cases, it was our dog who got the kids back home. And that was really, really sweet. But it's so funny because when our youngest, he was only about five. And like I said, it was probably a half hour that, you know, we realized, okay, he's, he's out. He's not on the path. Where'd he go? We're all looking. Mm -hmm. If you were to ask him even today, it was like, yeah, there was a day that I spent like 10 hours in the woods. I was afraid I was going to have to sleep outside. I was afraid I was going to die of starvation. You know, like that's how big it is <laughs> in yeah. his brain yeah. um, because, right? Like, so imagine you're you're driving with your dad and he says you're lost and now you can't get home. Like, what do you do? Oh, I guess we starve. Like, yes, it it's immediately is. what you go to. <laughs> you know, so yeah, when it comes to intercessory prayer. I think this verse can be a really good reminder to be praying for our unsaved friends and family, to be praying for people who, you know, maybe they're not spiritually lost, but maybe they are just kind of in that I'm floundering. I don't feel like I've got direction, that kind of thing. Yeah. Very important. Again, like I said, I'm a wretch, you're a wretch, we're all a wretch, but we do all have people in our lives who are feeling that to a greater degree. And you're, you're Mm -hmm. absolutely right to remember to be praying for them rather than judging them to be praying for them. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. I appreciate that a lot. All right. Verse two. Oh, go ahead. Did you, did you have more? No, no. I was just saying, I I, I mean, this is all such good stuff. Should we move on to verse two? And and I I love it. it. The language twas, twas Uh grace. (laughs) (laughs) Why don't you read it for us? All right. (laughs) Twas grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember that hour I first believed. Yeah, do you want to give us the the elevator version of it? Well, the elevator version is I was very skeptical at the time. And so I believe that my, the the moment that I really realized I needed, I, I needed the Lord beyond myself. You know, I did my, I come from an evangelical background as an adult, my Mm. husband and I were attending an evangelical church. And so everybody's story will look a little different. I don't necessarily believe there's one particular formula to salvation. The Bible is Mm. pretty clear that you you believe and are saved. You you need to be born again, whatever that means to you, whatever that looks like for you. That's, you know, that's between Mm -hmm. you and God. But for me, it was a moment where I did ask the Lord, I, I am not doing this well on my own anymore. And so this is what I said in my, to, to Jesus. Uh-huh. Well, at church, they say this is going to work. So why don't you take over my heart? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, it was very much, well, this is what they're telling me at church. And so, mm-hmm. and, and I remember the next day, it's not like there were any bells and whistles. There was, you know, no angel singing or I still, you know, a friend there of probably mine probably were, says, you just couldn't hear him. You couldn't hear him. There were <laughs> angels singing. Yeah. I just didn't know. Right. I, I, was, just, I was on my way <laughs> to sanctification, but um, uh-huh. you know, I, I have a, a friend I'll always remember. She said, when the day I was saved, it's not like all my problems went away. My thighs were the same size, you know? And so mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. not everything changed, but I do recall waking up and thinking about God. And that was mm-hmm. never something I would have done before. Yeah. Naturally, my brain was open to the things of the Lord. And and so, yeah, I mean, the hour I first believed, okay, was it an hour? Was it a day? What is it your first year of really understanding what salvation meant? Mm-hmm. But how precious was, was that beginning moment? And I think yeah. as we continue to walk with the Lord, sometimes it's hard to remember how precious and exciting and treasured 
that experience really was in our lives. And so it's Mm -hmm. a reminder to me that that salvation is just as precious today as it was the moment I first received it. Yeah. And what am I doing? How am I responding to the Lord with gratitude for it? Mm -hmm. And there is something sweet about those first moments of learning to live with Christ and learning to love him and learning to accept his love for you. You know, it's almost like a courtship, you know, there's something special about the engagement period. There's something special about the first date, you know? And so I know for me, it was, I was 12 when I went to a youth group retreat Mm -hmm. where I, I really, that was the moment where it was pretty dramatic and it was okay this is not something that I'm going to do when I'm an adult. And that's, that's always the impression I had. It was like, Jesus is who the grownups talk about and know. And Jesus is who the grownups teach you about. And I was 12 when I realized, no, Jesus is the savior who like loves me and wants to be in a relationship with me. And one of the big dramatic changes from my heart, and and like you said, it's, it's different for some people. It's not a moment for some people. It's real dramatic for some people. Nothing changes for others. You wake up and your whole life feels different. The biggest change for me was, or at least one of the big changes is I just felt like I could finally understand what I read in the Bible because before I would read the Bible because I was told I was supposed to, and I just, there, there truly was just a veil, you know, it was like, there was very little comprehension. There was very, like nothing was getting through. It was almost like if you were to like eat a meal, but like spit out every bite after you chewed, yeah. like that's the nourishment that I was getting from scripture before and then it turned into like it it was a night and day now you could digest it yes you could digest it I understood it I could I I remember Psalms was especially confusing to me before that moment it was like these are just words you know like and I I wasn't a bad reader It, it wasn't like the intellectual side I wasn't connecting with there truly was just a a veil. And once that veil was lifted, it it was really dramatic. Oh, I love that story so much. How did I not know that about you? Because, you yeah. know, as friends, especially as adults, you've been walking with the Lord a long time. Right. How, how often do we stop and say, well, how, how did you come to know Jesus? <laughs> right. right. Well, it's I funny because that. I was, I was picturing to myself, actually, I think I did ask her once about, cause I, I had forgotten, even though I know we talked about it before that you were saying as an older adult, yeah. I mean, not old, old, but you know, well, I mean? you know, I, compared to where I am now, 28 still sounds pretty young, but I have lived still quite again. a bit of adult life. You know, I was married. Yes. My husband yeah, and I have exactly. been married for a year and the Lord saved yeah. us at the same time That's through so cool. wonderful and it's it's wonderful, but we didn't know it. We didn't know it. So we, we reached uh-huh. a moment around that time. My husband Chad had also surrendered to the Lord and, and I had uh-huh. surrendered to the Lord. And then we met, we were being discipled by this wonderful couple. We met up with them and they said, So, you know, have have you asked to receive Jesus yet? And I one of us looked at the other and said, I have, have you? And the other looked and said, I have, have you? And so <laughs> that's how we didn't even know it was this momentous yeah. occasion we were supposed to share with each other. Okay. It was just so cool how God worked. But but you're right. It's the whole idea of there is a change. And for some of us, it's going to be more dramatic. I love knowing that scripture proved itself true in your experience, that God gave you that gift, right? That's awesome. I'd, I'd been mute. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I was coughing for a minute. So I muted and I've got to unmute. Yeah. Well, and, and I love to, I, I love just as an author, I love the language Twas grace that taught my heart to fear and grace, my fears relieved. Right. So you've got yeah. this juxtaposition of, it wasn't until God came and touched my heart that I knew what it meant to fear God. And at that same time, he cast out all these other fears yes. <laughs> that I had had. So do you have any like stories or testimonies of God dealing in your heart with fear? Oh my goodness. Yes. I mean, well, I, and you and I've talked about this before. I have a history of anxiety, so it runs in my family. Mm -hmm. So fears for me would manifest in all sorts of ways, not just worry, but actual fears. For example, my husband's a hunter, so he would leave Mm -hmm. on weekends to go hunting and I would be home by myself and literally could not fall asleep. I'd hear every little, Mm -hmm. you know, freak in the house. Yeah. And, you know, and, and I, I will tell you that I, you know, sought some 
medical assistance for that, which I believe is also God's provision. But at the same mm-hmm. time, he worked through that to the point where I can just pray, you know, what can man do to me? Mm-hmm. And I sleep like a baby now. Oh, and nice. so I'm very, very grateful that the Lord showed me, first of all, this fear is not of me. Mm-hmm. And so I'm going to give you the tools you need to conquer it. And I'm very grateful. And some people, some people can pray away those things. Others can't. But if God mm-hmm. leads you to the, the right solution, he will bless it. So mm-hmm. fears, absolutely. And, you know, I, I here's a pretty neat story, actually. I'll make this short, but it plays out even in how we how we speak to other people, how we encourage other people. My older daughter was, I think, five years old in kindergarten. Mm-hmm. And she, for the first two weeks of school, she would cry every day at lunchtime because she missed Aww, mom. And baby. the teachers didn't tell us until two weeks in that she Aww. had been crying every day. Yeah. And it's natural, right? She's, I was a stay-at-home mom at the time. So she was mm-hmm. home with me all day. And then at lunchtime, it was a pause in the busy day. And she missed mommy because mommy was usually the one making her lunch. Mm -hmm. And so we talked to her about scriptures that say, do not fear. And she Mm -hmm. came home the day after this conversation and she was just beaming in the car and she had recited some scripture we had given her about do not fear. And she said, Mm -hmm. it worked, mama. It worked. I didn't cry because she was afraid to go down to lunch without mom. And so there is power in the word of God. There is Mm -hmm. power in the word of God. He uses it in adults. He uses it with children. Yeah, power in it. And he doesn't want us to be, he doesn't want us to be gripped by fear. And that's, Mm -hmm. that's a, that's a lifelong challenge for me because I still have plenty of worries that if I'm not careful will prohibit me from doing certain things in my life. But I know at the end of the day, God's got that all figured out already. Nothing happens that is not, that is not according to his plan or permitted by his will. And therefore, it is that grace that relieves those fears because we know there's there's so much more to the story than we could ever understand. So just to trust God and his grace, that we don't yeah. need to be afraid. So much easier to say than it is to do. But when you have the power of the Holy Spirit within you, you have the ability to tackle that fear in ways you can't otherwise. Yeah. Well, and I, I love how God can deal with fear differently with different people. So in some cases it's alleviating the fear. And in other cases, it's giving you grace to walk through the fear, right? Just like the addict who gets saved. Sometimes God just heals them in a moment of any craving and, and they never go back. And other times in other situations, he gives you the grace to continue to deal with your addiction and to turn to him. And I mean, we all, we all love the more dramatic stories because those have the, (laughs) those have the feel good side to it. But you know, I think about when you were talking about not being able to sleep and, and fear there for me, I don't deal as much with the anxiety side of stuff. So when I do, it's pretty easy for me to pinpoint, like, this is not from me. So, you know, let's say I'm lying in bed. Usually I lie in bed and then I fall asleep and that's kind of all there is to it. If I'm lying in bed and like my heart's racing and I feel super anxious and like my, my legs need to wiggle and, you know, I don't immediately go to, I'm a terrible Christian because God tells me not to be anxious and I'm obviously anxious, right? I go to, yeah. Ooh, what did I, you like, when was my last cup of coffee <laughs> <You know? laughs> Yeah, <laughs> or, or that kind of thing? And like certain supplements can make me more jittery and, yeah. you know, and so again, it's, it's knowing how God wants to work in your personal life based on what you specifically need. And that is, it mm-hmm. is beautiful. And the other thing I like about this, you know, as we're thinking about you know, the hour we first believed, whether that's like a literal, you know, yep, that first hour, or just kind of that symbolic, just learning to walk with Christ. And if you go back to that, like you can, it can help you have grace with people who maybe haven't had as much time with the Lord, or they're not as far on their journey with Christ, but there still is something just beautiful and gorgeous about it. You know, like if you're, you know, your teenager is bringing home the homecoming date and like, they're just super awkward with each other, but it's kind of adorable too. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Like we know that a relationship is meant to progress beyond that, 
but we also know that there is something just delightful and sweet about those beginning steps. I love, I think it's the book of Amos. It's like, don't despise the the day of small beginnings, yes. you know, and like, don't, don't feel bad that we start with baby steps or don't look, you know, if you're marathon running by now, don't look down on the person who's still crawling, you know? Yes. And don't despise your own small beginnings. I actually tell yes. that to my clients sometimes, which yeah, is for just sure. because you are not necessarily at the same level as someone else doesn't mean that mm -hmm. where you are right now is not still God ordained and beautiful. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Like my very first check I got from Amazon, my first royal check, and, and I've been writing long enough. It was actually a check in the mail and it was <laughs> for like around $11. And I was so proud. Yeah. And I look back at that moment and I'm still really proud, you know, just like if your kid comes home and let's say like they're really struggling in spelling and they come home with their very first, like, 70%. And that's the highest they've ever gotten. Like you're proud of them, you know, yep, <laughs> at the very yep. least you should be. <laughs> so, yes. Like, you did it. So yeah. So true. Uh, when we look at intercession, is there anything specifically that this verse would lead your hearts? Any concerns that this heart would lead your prayers toward? Oh, well, you know, toward the people I love who also grapple with fear, I think yeah. it, it, it reminds me to, to pray for them. But also, honestly, especially, you know, at the time of this recording, we are heading into the election. And so overall, I think our, our country as a whole is, can be motivated by fear. And, mm -hmm. and I, I don't say this specifically about politics, but about any cultural shifts or cultural changes. And so yeah. I I think it's important to be praying just for for our communities, for mm -hmm. um, for our country as a whole, that that it, change is inevitable and you might not like the change that comes, but God's still got it all covered and all figured out. So let's not be afraid of what comes next. Let's look at it as part of his overall plan. So that's what comes to mind for me. How about for you? Yeah, for sure. People who are dealing with fear, praying through your own fears. And then also, you know, when we talk about the hour, I first believed praying for people who are beginning their relationship with Christ, right? It's like the sower and the seed, the, the brand new seedlings do need some extra care and attention, yeah. you know, like I don't need to worry that the 50 foot tall tree in my backyard is not going to get enough water today. Right. Yes. But if it's like a two inch tall green bean seedling that I've just planted, I, I would need to worry about that kind of thing. Yeah. So I think there is almost like special prayer attention to give to, to new believers. That's a good reminder for, because I think we're all pretty on board with, yeah, let's pray for our unsaved friends. Let's pray for our unsaved family members. And then I think the temptation could be, yay, they got saved. Thanks, God. And and that's kind of the last he hears mm -hmm. about it. <laughs> yeah. Like, like in fairy tales where it ends with the marriage, that's but right. nobody talks about what happens <laughs> the 50 years of that marriage is happening, right? Right. Right. <laughs> exactly. Like what's all the baggage? Yeah, or the first year of marriage. <laughs> that's when they really need your help. <laughs> right, right. Well, let's go into verse three. And I realized that the one that I've got on that we're reading from is the one that doesn't even have the toils and snares verse in it. So oh my goodness, so funny. I'm we'll gonna, have to find one. I'm going to swap out verse three. I'm pretty sure I know it. So through many dangers, toils and snares, I have already come to grace that brought me safe thus far and grace will lead me home. Yeah. So through yeah. What jumps out dangers. to you in that? Oh my goodness. It's funny. Actually, what, what jumps out to me is, is actually not, not myself at this moment, toils and snares. My husband and I often talk about some of the not smart things he did when he was, you know, around 20, 21 years old <laughs> and how those are, those were some toils and snares and, and God has brought him through. And, and I think too, for myself, just decisions I've made in the past that were probably not wise. Maybe you don't even know at the time that they're not wise, but how far has he brought us? Yeah. And he will lead us safely home. And yeah. it's not that we are on our own. That word lead says mm -hmm. that he is ahead yeah. of us. He's guiding us there. So we're never, never alone. I mean, think about all the dangers that he's brought me through. I've already come through all these dangers and he's brought me yeah. safe up to this point. And that is proof that he will continue to bring me safe to the end. Yeah. Right. 
I really like in Isaiah where God talks, and I'm going to have to paraphrase it, but he says, like, I don't bring to the moments of birth and not bring forth the delivery, right? Yeah. And it's the sense of like, I haven't brought you this far to leave you. I haven't brought you through all of these things to forsake you. And so I think this is, it's a really cool lead in from the last verse where we're kind of remembering our very first baby steps as believers. And then this one is like, and now look at everything God has brought you through. Like, it's beautiful to think about your wedding day, for example. It's beautiful to think about your honeymoon. It's also so beautiful to think about all the really, really hard things that you and your husband have gone through <laughs> and, yes. and this feeling of, you know what, we made it through, we made it through this and we made it through that and we weathered this storm and God didn't bring us through all of that just to forsake us now. Yes. And there's a, there's such a richer meaning now, you know, after 20 mm -hmm. some years of marriage to look yeah. back and say, it's not just that God brought us together, but he brought us through so yeah. much already. And we're mm -hmm. stronger because of it. And high five you and me, because we made it, right? And, and we're, <laughs> yeah. we're going to make it the next 20, 30 years, however many God has for us. And right. so it's just, a, it, this verse is a reminder to me of how God is our protector. He's our provider. You know, he hedges us in. Scripture talks so much about how he, he is surrounding us. He's helping us. And there's my puppy, which I promised you would be barking. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> He's agreeing. Exactly. So very, He's giving very, his amen. Is he? Yes. <laughs> in his own, own special way. Uh, so to me, that is a constant reminder, which goes back to the, the verse about fear, right? Why do we not fear? Why do we not need to? And why does the Lord tell us in mm. scripture not to fear? Because he knows we will naturally, but mm. he also knows that he's got this all figured out and he goes before yeah. us, he goes behind us and, and his grace is going to lead us home. Ultimately, the point of this earthly life is to be more like Jesus and mm -hmm. not just, you know, we're not saved as this whole entire hymn is about salvation, but not just so that we can be beamed up to heaven, right? It's so that we have power for living here and faith that someday mm -hmm. uh, we will receive the reward even after it's through some toils and snares. Yeah. Well, and I think it can teach us humility too. Like this isn't saying, Hey, I got through all of these trials. Why can't you pull yourself up by your bootstraps and do the same, you know, which yes. is a kind of a prevalent attitude in certain circles. This is saying, no, it is God who brought me all this way. And I think that the more we remind ourselves of that, yes, it helps us to face future trials with a little more confidence and a little more grace. It's like, okay, we made it through that. We're going to make it through this. But it also really helps us to give grace to others when we realize, you know, what, it was God's grace that got me through this. If it hadn't been for God's grace, I would have been like 20 times the wreck <laughs> that yes. anybody else might have been. And just keeping that kind of humility there. Yeah. Yeah. Really good points. Yeah. And intercession wise, I mean, this can definitely be a good reminder to be praying for your own toils and snares, if you're going through those, and I always hold it, if you're not going through a season of like intense suffering at the moment, it is kind of imperative <laughs> and good stewardship of your season of rest to be interceding for those who are, right? So mm -hmm. basically pray for your toils and snares or pray for the toils and snares that others are going through. And that's a really good, yeah, reminder that, Again, when you look at this tri the trials that God has brought you through, and then you think about, okay, who was praying you through those times? Yeah. And then you could almost be the person who prays someone else through a similar struggle. Yeah, there's so many stories, right? We all know, mm -hmm. you know, I know of friends who were prayed through something difficult, and it, yeah. it made a difference. Yeah, it does make a difference. Yeah. And it doesn't always have to be like, oh, I remember that Sally's nephew is having the surgery. So I'm going to pray for Sally's nephew. It can be, yeah, I remember how horrible it was to have a kid in the NICU. So today I'm just praying for all the kids yeah. in the NICU and all the nurses and all the parents, right? So it doesn't even have to be like a specific, it can be, but it doesn't have to be. Yeah. God knows who needs that prayer. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. All right. And now we're on to, this might be be my favorite of the verses when we've been there 10,000 years bright shining as the sun we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun mm 
And I think this is probably why it's become a associated as a funeral hymn, which is so funny because for me growing up in the church, like, no, this is like, this is the hymn you sing. It's like, this is, this isn't a funeral song. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is, this is sort of a, a, a catch all for people who maybe even aren't churched. Right. But, and yet, right. yeah. And yet you're absolutely right. This is, this is the end game, Right. When mm-hmm. we've been with the Lord 10,000 years, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Eternity. It's talking about yeah. eternity. We've been there 10,000 years. We have another 10,000 and then 10,000 more and, <laughs> and, and uh-huh. bright shining as the sun. I mean, you and I were talking earlier before we, we started recording about sunshine in winter and how we hope oh, yeah. to get it <laughs> <laughs> right? in Alaska, in the Midwest. And and mm-hmm. just the, the I, I love how the hymn as scripture often does gives us a picture from nature that just makes sense to us right what does it mean when the sun is shining that means something you connect to that concept to that visual to the feel of sunshine on your face and that's what we will be we're going to be shining bright as the sun and we have we're going to have all of eternity to sing god's praise you know what's interesting about that to me is I, I was reading something recently about how often we can hear things that are inaccurate or discouraging, mm-hmm. from the moment, right? Mm-hmm. And and one was, I forget exactly who said it, but it was somebody who mentioned that there was a, a worship leader in church who said, if you don't like this worship, you're going to hate heaven. And she was just freaking out because I think one of her children didn't necessarily Aww. love the singing part. Right. And so we need to remember what singing God's praise actually means. Yeah. It is a posture of worship and of gratitude. It doesn't mean you have to love singing or playing an instrument. It just means mm. we, we will be in a place where we fully understand how God is worthy of our praise and we will want to do nothing but spill it out over to him. Yeah. Can you imagine? And I say I that think, as somebody who loves music, worship music. So I know. Well, and I think about how many times in Revelation it talks about in heaven how you hear every nation and every tribe and every tongue. And to me, that that flies against this notion we have that once you get to heaven, you become just like everybody else, right? You wear the exact same white gown and you're the exact same height and you sing the exact same style of music. Right. Like wow. even in heaven, we maintain our uniqueness, our cultural distinctions, our heart language, probably like our fashion. Do you know what I mean? Like yes. it's not going to be necessarily. And and again, everything we know about heaven, it, it has to come with humility and with conjecture. Right. Yeah. But yeah. If you're hearing every nation and every tribe and every tongue, you're probably seeing every color of the rainbow. You're seeing every kind of fabric, right? You're seeing every type of garb and it's, it's all for the glory of God. And, and I think that heaven does involve more than just, you know, like one never ending concert, right? I think the concert's going to be so great that we definitely wouldn't get bored if that's what it was. <laughs> but I think there is yes. going to be more to it. You know, the the lion yes. and the lamb are going to lay down, which means at some point we're, you know, you and I might be walking through a grassy field and be like, oh, look at that cute little lion. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And, and scripture you know. says we'll have jobs in heaven. I mean, there is life happening in mm-hmm. heaven, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and we maintain that distinction. And I think that that's such a, beautiful call and a challenge to find how does your soul long to worship God? It might not be through a hymn. It might not be through contemporary worship music. It might not be through music at all. Like my husband, he doesn't get emotionally touched by music like ever. And so for him, like the worship is the part of the church service that he could take it or leave it. I mean, he intellectually recognizes that it's an important part. And he knows that for people like me, like that's a very important way to connect with God. But for him, it's more about, you know, like studying and finding this little nugget of truth in this really obscure passage in one of the minor prophets or that kind yes. of thing. For Which some is still people, an act of worship, right? It's I an know, act of worship to recognize that value. Yeah. Yeah. Or, you know, that's why I, I liked writing the chapter in Toils and Stairs toward the beginning where she's doing that prayer journaling. She's got kind of this like prayer, prayer, script, prayer and scripture right? and art and scrapbooking yeah. kind of all in one. 
and how we can use the the creative gifts that God has given us. Like I remember the first day that I learned that my violin wasn't just like this thing I had to practice because I was told to, it was like an instrument that I could worship God to. And that was so freeing. And it just, it opened up so much more to my, to my heart and to my soul. And so maybe I I think there is the, the Christian who's like, yeah, I hear other people talking about worship and I feel like I'm missing something because we equate worship with music and we equate music with the style of music that is sung at the church you go to or the church you grew up in. Right. And for some people, hymns are like, they're, they're stoic and they're archaic and they don't speak to anything. And for some people, the contemporary stuff is like cheesy or shallow. Like you need to find what resonates with you. I have a friend, she's a missiological ethnomusicologist and it's like the most interesting job title in the entire world. And what she does is she, and she does it more from the academic side, but she studies like how do different cultures make music as worship and even the idea of like what is music we think that that should be easy to define but it it's pretty hard for acad- academics to come up with a definition that applies to every single culture what would be seen as as music to them and so then okay so if music is that hard to pin down now we say okay define worship <laughs> that's right. going to be <laughs> even harder so for you it might be you know, waving your arms in the air or dancing before God in your, in your room or belting in the shower, or it might be just like sitting in your pew, feeling somber and, and, and feeling the, the weight of the seriousness of being before God. And so again, I would encourage for people who are like, I don't know, worship, that's like what touchy feely people do. And it it never really like, I, I, I don't get it. It's probably just that you, I think a good prayer for you would be ask God to show you what way he designed you to worship him in. Yeah. Cause it is yeah. different. And there's different and no right or wrong either. Exactly. Right. That, and that's, and unless it's we, sin. Well, right. There's you can't that. Say, but, you know. <laughs> my, my way to worship God is to kick the dog. I don't think that that's yeah. probably. Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> no, don't do that. But, but you know, it, we, we have this discussion often in our house because our, our daughters are at a high school that's of a different denomination than the church we attend mm-hmm. and their style of worship is more conservative. And mm-hmm. our church as an evangelical church is it's more contemporary Mm -hmm. at at my older daughter's youth group the kids literally jump up and down the entire worship set they're just they're dancing Mm -hmm. and it's how they choose to express their authentic worship yeah whereas you know some of my daughter's other friends from school cannot relate to that but that doesn't mean one or the other is is right or wrong exactly it's it's different it's how is God mm-hmm. wired you? What did you grow up with? How do yeah. you feel expressive? And again, not just about your feels. We know that the mm-hmm. heart is deceitful, right? But but how is God wired you to, to just reach out to him in praise and gratitude and wonder? Yeah. Yeah. And if it looks different for you than what it looks like for someone else, as long as it's not sinful, then <laughs> can we, you know, can we support mm-hmm. each other's yeah. definition personally of this is how it looks for me to worship? Again, not saying that there is relative truth in worship. There is one God that we worship. And yet Mm -hmm. how you might express that. Maybe you love the old hymns. Maybe I prefer some new contemporary music. Maybe, you know, my, Mm -hmm. for my husband, it's sitting in the woods and, and, and looking at nature and being so Mm -hmm. grateful for God. Yeah. And, you know, and like, kind of like you're saying your husband does, he, he absolutely Mm -hmm. is attending worship service and, and and understand that's, that's, that's part of the deal, but he doesn't he doesn't respond to it emotionally and spiritually, even the way that I do, Mm -hmm. not right Mm -hmm. or wrong, just exactly according to how God has made us. Yeah. One of the things my ethnomusicologist friend asks people is what kind of music did you like to listen to as a teen or kind of in your coming of age? And that can often give you a glimpse into maybe like the style of worship that is potentially the most likely to speak to you. 
Like, so I'm millennial. I graduated high school in 2000 and my kind of coming to Christ started like right in the mid nineties where, you know, I had that experience like, oh, the Bible makes sense and stuff like that. So like songs like shout to the Lord, like yes. those take me <laughs> back. Right. Yes. And in the church we go to now, one of the reasons why as the person who chooses the songs, I try to do 60, 40 to 50, 50 new versus contemporary from one set to another. And there were some Sundays where I lean more towards like the, the, the old, old classics. And I have people in their sixties and seventies and eighties coming up to me saying how much it spoke to them. Right. Mm -hmm. It was like, I remember singing this the Sunday I got saved. Thank you so oh, much for putting this in there, you know? So yeah, I love that. again, it's uh, yeah. For people who, who need a blast from the past, go ask yourself, okay, what music did you love as a teenager? If you grew up in the church, what were you listening to? Like what, what music was at your church at that time? And if you didn't, you can, I mean, I'm sure you could Google like, okay. So when you were growing up, Becky, outside of the church, who were some of the bands that you loved? Oh my like goodness. Secular. Is, I was, kind of I was all about into? the angsty singer songwriters. So, you know, yeah. give me Tori Amos and Alanis yeah. Morissette. And all okay. <laughs> so you could, you could even look up like who are Christian singers? Like, yeah. you know, Alanis Morissette. Angsty singer songwriters. Yeah. yeah. Or, you know what I do? So I'm, I'm very nerdy in that I, I love musicals and some of my most Maybe not most, but I have worshipful experiences when I am watching a musical, even if it is not a Christian musical. Me too. And Me so too. one thing I love to do, I was doing this even last night before bed, I'll take a song that really speaks to my heart and like really resonates with me. And then I'll take the tune and just try to write new lyrics to it so that it is more specific we a hymn to God. So let's say you can't find the Alanis Morissette equivalent. <laughs> Take your favorite song. Wait, is she the is God if God was one of us? Was that her? Oh no, no, but that's not a good one. Yeah, I like that song too. <laughs> that's hilarious. See, for me growing up, my music, it was like the boys to men, you know, like yes. that kind of thing. Like I'm a, yeah. I'm a tiny bit too old to have really gotten into like in sync like if I were three years younger like that would have been my thing but yeah it was the it was the boys to men Mariah Carey oh you know like goodness just yeah really soulful new kids and on so, the block were they no was that before that your was, time? I was I remember being like in elementary school that was the first oh, band yeah. I was ever aware of but I didn't really get what it meant to be like boy crazy for a band yet but I had friends yeah. who were and it really confused me <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what are you, what are you guys doing? Like, we're adults. Why do we want to listen to adults? Like, don't we want to listen to big singing songbooks oh or something? Goodness, that's so funny. That's kind of how I still feel about some of those bands. <laughs> yeah, right. So I will speak to the the very small percentage of our listeners who like grew up just with me. So you're too too young to have gotten into New Kids on the Block, too old to have gotten heavily into NSYNC, but you loved Boys to Men. I forgot their name. I was going to tell people about a about a Christian group, and then I completely forgot the raps. But I'm going to guess if you Google like Christian music today's Boys to Men, I bet you'll find them. They've got like some really good holiday music out there. They're, are you going to look it up? While I I'm am looking it up right now. Up their name. <laughs> I am. I was... <laughs> and you know, do you know what Google AI says? There isn't much info about Christian music's today's boys to men right now. <laughs> okay, oh, I'm, I'm going to find it because now like I've already Christian started this. Um... And Christian music boy band 2024. That's what I'm going to look up. Oh, now Christian I'm just getting set. King news boys. I think that it does might not be help King's me. Return. I think okay. I think the group I'm thinking of might be called I'm almost positive it has Kings in the name. So King's and Return. I think the group I'm thinking of is called King's Return. Oh yeah, they even look like boys to men. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that you know, this kind of that whole feel, the, the exact same style of harmony. Yeah. Um, because there there truly is something about for, for those of us who are musically wired, there is something that can can speak to you so quickly through a certain style of music, right? Yeah. In the same way that if I was, let's say, so 
by college, I was pretty close to being considered fluent in Spanish. Like the only thing I could have done would have been to have like moved and, and only spoken and listened to Spanish to have improved. But if I sat in a Spanish speaking church and listened to a sermon on Spanish, I would understand the words. I would be able to follow the sermon, but it still wouldn't speak to me in the same way that speaking, you know, like sitting in an English speaking church does. Yeah. And so in the same way that we kind of have like a first language, we almost have like a, a, a heart music, right? And mm. so finding what your heart music is can be a neat step in, yeah. you know, figuring out, okay, how did God design me to worship? And for you, maybe it's, maybe we should even expand to like heart worship. Maybe you're more of the like drawer and scrapbooker like Daphne yes. Or, you know, maybe you get into the dance side of it or the study side of it, or mm -hmm. I love, yes. I don't do it as anymore because of my carpal tunnel, but I used to love just copying Bible verses and I didn't do it for the handwriting or anything. I think, I mean, some people could and do a great job. I just did it because it, it forced me to slow down you yes. know, and think through yes. each verse. So well, for some, it's a very creative mm -hmm. process and that draws them nearer to God. In fact, I have two clients exactly. who, who do, who serve their customers in that way with, mm -hmm. uh, with visual arts. One is really yes. in Bible journaling. Another creates these beautiful coloring books and things where people can use yeah. creative expression in their worship. Because mm -hmm. for some people, that is what worship is. And God is creative yeah. and he's the great artist. And so it makes yeah. sense that various people will reflect various aspects of that. Exactly. So in the same way, you can ask yourself, okay, what kind of music really speaks to me? You can even ask, like, what kind of hobbies do, do I find most relaxing or most almost nostalgic, right? Like, yeah. did you get into any specific type of crafting as a teen? Oh, goodness. I, I loved to bake and I made, you know, everybody's making kind of friendship bracelets, but I used to do a lot of drawing when I was younger. Okay. I don't so much anymore. I think someone yeah. kind of beat that creativity out of me. I don't know. But Isn't that sad how uh, that happens? Yeah, yeah. It is sad how that mm -hmm. happens. I think we're a lot more open to our creative nature as kids then mm -hmm. you know, somehow the the world sometimes will not uh, not remove it from us. I think it's still inherently in there, but maybe yeah. we feel as though we have less permission to be creative. Maybe exactly. as we get older. But I I, I, I loved crafts and painting and stickers mm -hmm. and all that sort of thing. Yeah. When I was what about you? Scratch and sniff stickers. That was my era. That really? Was oh, you. that's yes. hilarious. <laughs> I used to do a lot of cross stitching. I really enjoyed that. Puzzles, jigsaw puzzles, which I still like doing. And yeah. I do find that to be, it, it can definitely be a worshipful kind of thing, you know, and this idea of like taking something that's a jumble and yeah. watching how it turns into something with order and beauty, like, mm -hmm. okay, that's, that's a lesson right there. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, I love that. I just, In fact, yeah, yeah, I love it. My daughter is, does crochet and puzzles uh, yeah. and both of those things just allow her to flex her brain yeah. and to think free thoughts and to, you know, I think there's something to be said about just clearing our busy, busy heads Exactly. And tuning into the thoughts that we can then direct to the Lord because we have the freedom mm -hmm. to do it. So many exactly. of us are so busy that we yeah. barely remember to stop and say hi to God during the day. Right. right? So mm -hmm. if you have a habit, a hobby that you instill as a habit that allows you mm -hmm. that freedom of mind to yeah. be able to generate conversation with the Lord. Yeah. I think that's so important. I say that as somebody who is terrible at that because what do I like to do? I like to read, which means I am following uh -huh. Daphne's plight. Well, perfect. Good segue. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's what you do. You wait until the audio book comes out, which should probably be in less than a month. And then you oh, can do great. both. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're right. Audio books. <laughs> oh. Well, how about for listener homework? Let's just say like pick one, either hobby or music style, set aside five to 15 minutes to just connect with the Lord in a new way. Maybe yeah. it's like just drawing a sketch in your journal, or I know one of the other counselors at the girls home where I used to work, she would lead the girls to an activity where you would read a Bible verse and basically like doodle what the verse represents. Like mm -hmm. if I, if I wanted to make this verse on the page, kind of like how Daphne does with her, her sketchbook, right? Like what would I, what would I draw? or write a poem. I, d I did this project and unfortunately it didn't survive a computer crash, but I wanted to write a poem 
inspired by each individual psalm. And I probably got like maybe up to 30 or 40 before like I stopped and then the computer died and, you know, but just whatever it is for you, or maybe it is, you know, doing a, doing a puzzle or making a scrapbook. We used to have a little photo album with all the pictures of the extended family when the kids were real little and we'd go through it like, God bless grandma. God bless grandpa, you know, God bless uncle, (laughs) that kind of thing. So yeah, think of, think of one thing and it doesn't have to take a ton of time and try to connect with God in a new way. Another thing I love to do if I get in a musical rut is like forcing myself to find a new song or two, because sometimes we can get into a little bit of a rut, you know, so find a new song or a song that you haven't thought about in forever. (laughs) Right. Mm-hmm. Or if you grew up in the church, you're like what, what contemporary Christian music was popular in 1997, yes. right? <laughs> like, find that playlist and, and let God take you back to those days or, yeah. or whatever it is. But yeah, I hope this was encouraging and gave you some food for thought. And Becky, thanks again for joining us and, and going through all of these verses together. This was a really fun exercise. And I think I'm going to do this with more hymns in the future. So meaningful. So thank you for inviting me to have the conversation. It's really fun. Yeah. Glad you joined us. And if you have not read Toil and Snares yet, another reason why I invited Becky to come on is because she has worked with me to create these beautiful gift boxes inspired by the Toil and Snares novel. So do you want to tell us a little bit about those, Becky? Yeah, I'm so excited about this bundle. So Alana and I have curated a box that is essentially a a collection of gifts that you can get for someone else or for yourself. So we have this wonderful collection of gift items that are all based on the theme of Amazing Grace. So I'm really excited. In addition to getting a copy of the book, Toils and Snares, you will also get an Amazing Grace journal, which is a devotional that has space for journaling and it has a beautiful beautiful bound cover that has a zipper just to keep it personal and private. And it's lovely. We also have a a camp mug. It's a wonderful wide mouth mug with a nice handle. Those big Um, mugs, like big and sturdy. Yes, big sturdy (laughs) mug. And it says, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. And it's exactly the kind of mug that I like to have on my desk throughout the day, you know, drink my tea. And it's, it's absolutely lovely. And then we also have a beautiful beautiful beaded bracelet that has a a plate that says Amazing Grace, a small gold plate that says Amazing Grace. And the rest is this collection of beautiful beads that are turquoise and and gold and can really, I think, go with any outfit. And also Alana is so kind as to offer us a sign a plate for a sticker plate for inside of the book Mm -hmm. signed by the author. So yeah, that's exciting. That makes the book even more unique to to right. yourself knowing that the author played a hand in gifting you this book so yeah, i'm yeah. very really excited about this bundle and so if, if you're interested in not just maybe finding a, a really meaningful gift that's super easy shopping for somebody mm-hmm. who would appreciate the book and the concept of amazing grace and really somebody who really loves the hymn mm-hmm. also consider consider gifting something to yourself because yes. the the journal in particular, alongside the book, I think is just going to be a wonderful springboard for examining more of who God is to you in relation mm-hmm. to the the hymn Amazing Grace and just all of the concepts that we've discussed behind it. So yeah. we're really excited about this fun, fun bundle. Yeah, we will put the link in the description. You can also find it at christianbooks.today. And thanks again for joining us.